maintain what it is that the author was really trying to do with the story, like what, what, what he or she is trying to say in the overall, and try to stay true to the, to the basic beats of the story if you can. Sometimes you can't. Um, try to keep your characters true to the characters as they were defined in the story. But the trickiest part I've found, like I said I've done three of them now, is when a, when a story is written in the first person, meaning that you are, you are reading the, that person's thoughts, right, as that person is interacting with other people. And like in a, state, in a Stephen King novel, you know, like Pet Cemetery or, or The Shining, you're, you're hearing, uh, you know, Jack's thoughts as, he's, as his mind is deteriorating, right? So then the trick becomes, now you're gonna turn that into a movie. How do you get that information out without having to do like a voiceover, like thinking kind of thing, which nobody likes, unless you're doing some like film noir kind of narration, right? Um, you have to find new and clever ways to get that information to the audience without it being too expositional, without it, um, uh, you know, like I said, without having a, a, a narration. You have to find more clever, you have to be clever about it. You have to find a way to say, how am I gonna get these thoughts out there so that it tells the story without it being distracting? So there was a lot of that in uh, the, last, uh, the last book I wrote, uh, the last uh, book I adapted. Um, there was a lot of that in, in Betsy Franco's uh, uh, book. So, um, so that's, that's the big challenge there. And I've actually come to really enjoy that challenge. You know, it was a little intimidating at first, when the, the first one I did, but now that I've done three of them, I'm kind of, I, I kind of get it and I kind of dig it. And I, I'm not afraid of it. <laughs> How common is it for the actual author of the book to want you to adapt it rather than someone else saying, I really like this story, let's try to get the rights to it. And adapt. Like, which, which way happens more? The actual author of the book seeking adaptation or? You, no, usually the, um, uh, the author of the book will be offered an option uh, for a certain amount of time. Um, I, I, well, kind of like the studios do. The studios you know, op will option a script for, you know, for two years or three years or something like that. In which case, they pay the, they pay the, the writer uh, a certain amount of money that will let them develop the project and potentially make the project in that time period. And if they don't make that movie in that time period, uh, they put it uh, in they, what they call turnaround, which means that they say, you know what, we decided we're not going to make this movie, so we're giving the rights back to you. You know, and you get to keep the option money. You don't have to give that back, but but they're basically saying, you know, no, we, we decided to move on, et cetera. Um, Todd and I had that happen uh, with um, with Woodstock, Woodstock, it's called. Um, Is it about Woodstock? Yes. Oh, okay, yeah. interesting. Um, it's a comedy about Woodstock, and um, so uh, 20th Century Fox optioned it, um, um, and they optioned it for like I think it was a year and a half or something like that to develop it. And they, they were trying to develop it and develop it. And I think Robert Duvall was attached at one point very briefly. And, um, but eventually, um, I, partly I think because it was a period piece in which were expensive. This is, this is before CG was available. Um, so it was quite a few years ago. Um, so eventually um, they, they put it in turnaround. They gave the rights back, and um, and which you know means that we could still bring that that uh, property to another studio, uh, and and have them option it and possibly make it. But will it happen? Probably not. <laughs> you know, especially if it's a script that's been around for a long time. It's it's a little harder. Um, but the difference is now that I, well. It would be a lot easier to make that movie now than then because, because it's a period piece and it took place and the, the, most of the movie takes place at the Woodstock Festival. Well, back then before CG, if you were gonna make that movie, 
first of all, you need, you know, a hundred picture cars from 1969. You need thousands of extras stretched out over a huge area uh, to replicate the, uh, you know, the, the, the hippies, you know, and everybody. And then you need the stages with the bands, right? right? And you need to pay for the music because it has to be the music That's from the true. festival, yeah. right? So that was an expensive endeavor, no doubt. And I think that's part of the reason they eventually turn, put it in turnaround. Nowadays, it'd be a lot easier because with CG, you don't need 100 picture cars. You need 10, and then the rest of them you fill in with CG. You may have them go back for miles and miles and miles. Oh. Same thing with the crowds. You have your hero hippies in the front, <laughs> and then you fill in the rest with, with CG characters because you can't tell that they're real or not. Do you need um, a Janis Joplin look like? Exactly. It's yeah. a, I mean that, and you need to know what about her music? Well, I'm, music, I'm not even sure what she. The music would still be expensive. Yeah, that's for uh -huh. sure. But um, and even if you did replicas of the music, you still have to pay for the rights. So you might as well get the real thing, right? That's um, oh, interesting. So, but um, and and the music is such an important part of the story. Um, in fact, we we utilized the music um, to actually represent what was happening in the dynamic between the family that were stuck there. They, they were stuck there. See, oh, it's stuck. Yeah. So um, um, great script. I got a lot of work because of that script. Again, huh. it was one of the one of the ones that people read as a sample and were like, "Oh, you're hired. That's great." You know. Um, so. Was it like a conservative family? Stuck? Yes. Oh, okay. Wow. That's... A, a retired, a re a retired <laughs> colonel. Oh, so when his 16 year old crazy. daughter runs off into the into the festival to look for her boyfriend, he has to go after her. So for him, it's like going into enemy territory, yeah. right? So there was a lot of great potential for humor there. Um, but um, but then Ang Lee made a movie about Woodstock, like I don't know, eight or nine years ago. Um, that did not do well. So we were like, well, we can't show it to anybody right now. Because <laughs> everybody was like, well, his movie did failed miserably. So which I, I'm not even sure if it failed miserably, but it did not do, you know, big numbers. So hmm. so, but you know, these this is what happens. <laughs> this is this is what it's like. Well, uh, and, and you know, thankfully my uh my lovely wife Leanne has been very patient with me and uh has um and she she's a a producer at Disney now, so she's doing fine. But she's always been um, very um, willing to let me pursue what I needed to pursue, which is which is great. So That's she's great. awesome. Nice. That sounds really funny. Yeah, a retired colonel. I, I, we love that script. <laughs> Todd and I always talk about. We'd love to be able to you know dust it off and put it out there again, and and you just got to wait for the timing to be right. You know what I mean? You know, also, you know, when you put a script out, every it goes out to everybody, right? For the most part. So everyone's reading. We had we had uh, Wood Woodstock was at CAA, and it went out, uh, you know, like with with a bunch of other scripts on the same day, and and we were we were um, uh, what do you call it? Um, we, um, I'm forgetting the word, but like we. we it was showing that we were doing really well. Like we were, we were expected to be the highest one that week, and it, and that's not what happened. <laughs> it it didn't. Uh, nobody bought it, and and then it sat around for like for like two years before 20th Century Fox um, uh, found a copy of it or was sent a copy or something, and and they read it and they said, oh, we well we like it, so we'll take it, and they they must have passed the first time around, but. But then you know you have turnover at the studios where, so the the, the executives who were there two years ago uh, are not there anymore, and there's new guys in, and maybe they haven't read that script. So, uh, you know, sometimes that's why some that's why a movie you know um, like Forrest Gump sometimes takes years and years and years and years to get made. It's because you got to have you've got to find the right person has to read it at the right time. Is that what happened, Eric Ross? Shopped it around for years. Oh yeah, from what I understand, I don't know the exact details of it, but it's kind of famously known that that the the movie was uh, uh, was out there years before and had been read all over town, and and you know finally um, it, it just took the right um, Robert Zemeckis and whoever else to to champion it. Wow, who'd have thought? Yeah, I know. <laughs>
So I always keep faith that, that uh, possibly some of those earlier scripts that we really loved so much might s still get made someday. Probably not, but it's possible. That's true. Yeah.